Part 2 Thorns and Prickles Hindrances The immediate obstacles to the development of samadhi and wisdom are a group of defilements that the Buddha called the Nivarana, or hindrances. He described them as overgrowths of the mind that stultify insight. They are five in number. 1. Gama Chanda, sensual thoughts. 2. Vyapada, ill will. 3. Tina Midda, sloth and torpor. 4. Uddacha Kukucha, agitation, guilt and remorse. And 5. Vichikicha, doubt and indecision. In the Anguttara Nikaya 5s, Sutta 51, the Buddha made clear the vital importance of dealing with the hindrances as follows. Without having overcome these five, it is impossible for a monk whose insight thus lacks strength and power to know his own true good, the good of others and the good of both, or that he will be capable of realizing that superior human state of distinctive achievement, a truly noble distinction in knowledge and vision. And earlier in the five, Sutta 23, the Buddha compared the hindrances to the baser metals impairing the purity of gold. Once the gold has been freed of impurities, then it becomes pliant and wieldy and can be wrought into whatever ornaments one wishes. Similarly, the mind freed of the five hindrances will be pliant and wieldy, will have radiant lucidity and firmness, and will concentrate well upon the eradication of the taints. To whatever state, realizable by the higher mental faculties one may direct the mind, one will, in each case, acquire the capacity of realization if the other conditions are fulfilled. The basic method for dealing with hindrances is to cultivate a mindful, balanced effort combined with positive regard for the meditation object to the extent that as yet unarisen hindrances do not arise in the first place. When that is not possible, and having become aware that they are caught in a hindrance, meditators are taught to abandon it without regret and patiently return to the meditation object. Rather than immediately re-establishing attention on the breath, Luang Po taught that at that moment of recognizing the hindrance for what it was and letting it go, meditators should also acknowledge the distraction as mainair, changeful, impermanent, unstable. By doing so, they introduced an element of wisdom into meditation that would gradually flourish as their meditation skills grew. When something arises in your mind, no matter if it's something you like or something you dislike, something you think is right or something you think is wrong, cut it right off by reminding yourself it's changeful. It doesn't matter what it is, just chop right through it. Changeful, changeful. Use this single axe to chop through mental states. Everything is subject to change. Where can you find anything real and solid? If you see this instability, then the value of everything decreases. Mental states are worthless. Why would you want things of no value? For those struggling with the hindrances and feeling discouraged at their lack of success, he gave the following encouragement. Even if your mind finds no peace. Merely sitting cross-legged and putting forth effort is already a fine thing. This is the truth. You could compare it to being hungry and having nothing to eat except plain rice. You've got nothing to eat with the rice and you feel upset. What I'm saying is, it's good that you've got rice to eat. Plain rice is better than nothing at all, isn't it? If plain rice is all you've got, then eat it up. Practice is the same. Even if you experience 
only a very small amount of calm, it's still a good thing. If the simple expedient of patiently returning to the object again and again was not working, then specific antidotes needed to be employed. There was much to be learnt in the quest to transcend the hindrances. Luang Po advised looking on them as teachers, or tests of wisdom rather than enemies. Sensual Desire The first hindrance occurs through indulgence in thoughts bound up with the sensual world. The meditator who is still unable to find satisfaction in meditation tends to seek pleasure, warmth and distraction by turning to the world of the senses. This hindrance's most powerful expression lies in sexual desires and fantasies, but it also includes taking pleasure in memories or imagination relating to any other aspect of the sensual world that the meditator finds attractive. Food, music, movies, sports, politics, any topic at all that is felt to be enjoyable by the one who dwells upon it. In dealing with this hindrance, Luang Po emphasized the protection of sense restraint. Eating little, sleeping little, talking little were made key principles for the Sangha at Wat Bapong. The mind was to be taught to avoid becoming engrossed in the general appearance or particular features of any sense object. It was not possible to simply turn off a habit of indulgence in sensual pleasures for the duration of a meditation session. There also had to be a constant effort to govern such desires in daily life. As the key condition for this hindrance is dwelling unwisely on the attractive aspects of sensual experience, the specific antidote lies in replacing it with wise reflection on the unattractive aspects. Sexual desire being the most potent and disruptive expression of the hindrance, it is the one to which most specific remedies are applied. Visualize the body as a corpse in the process of decay, or think of the parts of the body such as lungs, spleen, fat, feces and so forth. Remember these and visualize this loathsome aspect of the body when lust arises. This will free you from lust. If you look at the human body and you like what you see, then ask yourself why. Investigate it. Look at head hair, body hair, nails, teeth and skin. The Buddha taught us to hammer in the reflection on these things. Distinguish them one by one. Separate them from the body. Visualize setting fire to them or peeling off the skin. Do that until you become fluent. Contemplation of the body has already been referred to as a meditation object in its own right and as a preliminary exercise preceding mindfulness of breathing. Here, it is employed as a means of hauling the mind back onto the middle path when it has strayed into the realm of the senses. Once the hindrance has been abandoned, meditators may then resume their focus on their original meditation object. Ill will Ill will is conditioned by ungratified desire. Its occurrence in meditation is often based on an obsession with things or people that are not doing, saying or being the way we would prefer. The mind picks up a rankling perception or memory and broods on it. In Jack Cornfield's Notes from a Session of Questions and Answers, Luang Po is asked for advice in dealing with this hindrance. How about anger? What should I do when I feel anger arising? You must use loving kindness. When angry states of mind arise in meditation, Balance them by developing feelings of loving-kindness. If someone does something bad or gets angry, don't get angry yourself. If you do, you are being more ignorant than they are. Be wise. Keep compassion in mind, for that person is suffering. 
fill your mind with loving kindness as if he were a dear brother. Concentrate on the feeling of loving kindness as a meditation subject. Spread it to all beings in the world. Only through loving kindness is hatred overcome. Sometimes you may see other monks behaving badly. You may get annoyed. This is suffering unnecessarily. It's not yet our Dhamma. You may think like this, he is not as strict as I am. They are not serious meditators like us. Those monks are not good monks. This is a great defilement on your part. Do not make comparisons. Do not discriminate. Let go of your opinions and watch your mind. This is our Dhamma. You can't possibly make everyone act as you wish or to be like you. This wish will only make you suffer. It's a common mistake for meditators to make. But watching other people won't develop wisdom. Simply examine yourself, your feelings. This is how you will understand. Although it makes sense for meditators to seek the most supportive environment for practicing meditation, there is almost always something or other that the mind, if it wishes, can latch onto with aversion. When meditators complained about external conditions disturbing them, Lung Po would reply that the problem did not lie in the condition. Conditions were just doing what conditions have always done and always will do, arise and pass away. The problem arose, he said, because the meditator was disturbing the condition. In other words, it was the meditator's aversion to the condition, rather than the condition itself, that was the true hindrance to meditation. Often the hindrance of ill will occurs as a dissatisfaction or frustration with the meditator's practice. Meditators can become aggravated by their inability to progress as fast as they hoped, angry at the particular problems that arise, resentful of physical pain that makes it hard to focus. They dwell on the things that they don't like again and again until a deep furrow is dug, into which their mind throws itself repeatedly. Meditation itself can become an object of aversion. A frightening experience or strong painful feelings while sitting may make the mind resist continuing the practice. At this stage, meditators look to fill their time with every possible activity except meditation. When affected by this hindrance, Lung Po encouraged his disciples to keep returning to the basic principle enshrined in the Four Noble Truths. Suffering arises through craving. In this case, the root of the problem lies in the desire not to have, not to be, not to have to experience the I don't need this mind. Your mind is chaotic because of craving. You don't want to think. You don't want to have anything going on in your mind. This not wanting is the craving called vipavatanha. The more you desire not to think, the more you encourage thoughts. You don't want the mind to think, so why do the thoughts come? You don't want it to be that way, so why is it? Exactly. It's because you don't understand your mind that you want it to be a certain way. While Lung Po emphasized this understanding of craving as an antidote to this hindrance, the suttas recommend meditation on loving-kindness. By its systematic development, thoughts of kindness and benevolence are able to replace thoughts of anger and resentment. Interestingly, this meditation was not one that Luang Po greatly encouraged for monastics. He considered it to be a risky practice for a celibate monk or nun, as the pure emotion of loving-kindness could easily morph into more sensual feelings. Also, Monastics who practiced loving-kindness meditation diligently often became very attractive to the opposite sex, which could also jeopardize their monastic vocation. Sloth and Torpor The third of the five hindrances, sloth and torpor, occurs most readily in a mind habituated to a high level of stimulation. 
In such cases, focusing on a single, unexciting object like the breath tends to induce feelings of boredom, followed by dullness. It can lead meditators losing their awareness altogether, sitting with head bobbing up and down, or slumped on their chest. This hindrance also afflicts meditators who indulge in the relaxed feelings that occur with the elimination of coarse mental agitation. In its more subtle forms, the hindrance can manifest as a state of mind that is calm, but stiff and unwieldy. On one occasion, the Buddha compared the mind overcome with sloth and torpor to a prisoner in a dark and stuffy dungeon. And at another time, he likened it to fresh water choked by water plants. For the monastics at Wat Bapong, the simple and repetitive way of life, free from most of the grosser kinds of sensual stimulation, reduced the likelihood that their minds would react against the discipline required in formal meditation. Luang Po's regular reminders to sustain mindfulness and sense restraint in all postures were thus aimed at reducing the gap between the meditator's awareness in periods of formal meditation and daily life. Monks were encouraged to observe factors that increased or decreased their tendency towards laziness and mental dullness. Food intake was one obvious variable. If you find yourself sleepy every day, try to eat less. Examine yourself. As soon as five more spoonfuls will make you full, stop. Then take water until just properly full. Go and sit. Watch your sleepiness and hunger. You must learn to balance your eating. As your practice goes on, you will feel naturally more energetic and eat less. But you must adjust yourself. Luang Po gave many exhortations aimed at inspiring in his disciples the wholesome desire to strive for freedom from defilement and to realize inner liberation. It was bearing this wholesome desire, Dhamma Chanda in mind, that played the largest role in guarding against the hindrance of sloth and torpor. Without cultivating this strong aspiration to penetrate the Four Noble Truths, meditators going through periods of emotional turmoil or strong defilement, could find their minds retreating into dullness during meditation as a means of anaesthetizing their mental pain. The weekly, all-night sittings were opportunities for monks at Wat Bapong to come face to face with drowsiness and to be given no choice but to seek for skillful means to overcome it. Emerging from a period of drowsiness after a steady refusal to give in to it could be an empowering and even rapturous experience. The patience accumulated by a regular practice of working with drowsiness was not an immediately obvious benefit, but many monks would acknowledge that over a period of months and years it became increasingly evident. Nevertheless, whenever monks were pushing themselves physically, during monastery work projects, for example, and particularly in periods of hot and humid weather, sloth and torpor could still be a major obstacle. Luang Po gave a number of practical tips. There are many ways to overcome sleepiness. If you are sitting in the dark, move to a lighted place. Open your eyes. Get up and wash your face or take a shower. If you are sleepy, change postures. Walk a lot. Walk backwards. The fear of running into things will keep you awake. If this fails, stand still. Clear the mind and imagine it's full daylight. Or sit on the edge of a high cliff or a deep well. You won't dare sleep. If nothing works, then just go to sleep. Lay down carefully and try to be aware until the moment you fall asleep. Then, as you awaken, get right up. Don't look at the clock and roll over. Start practicing mindfulness from the moment you wake up. Continuity of practice was essential. If meditators allowed sloth and torpor, 
in its guise as laziness or reluctance to hold them back, they were lost. They had to develop a consistent effort, impervious to passing moods. When you feel diligent, practice. When you feel lazy, practice. Agitation and worry. The fourth hindrance consists of two kinds of mental noise. Firstly, agitation, a busy restlessness of mind, and secondly, worry or guilty thoughts about the past. Only when the mind is asked to sustain attention on an object is the full extent of its habitual unrest revealed. The mad pinballing of the mind that ensues is the first great frustration experienced by a new meditator. As with other hindrances, the default remedy is to patiently bring the mind back to the object again and again until the mind is tamed. But when the mind is agitated, trying to restrain it can be a tiring and thankless task. Lung Po would caution meditators to be wary of falling into the trap of Wipbawa Tanha, the craving to get rid of something. Rather than providing the impetus to free the mind from this hindrance, this kind of craving only made matters worse. A confused meditator asked him, So when it darts about, I should just keep watching it? When it darts about, it's right there. You don't follow it, but you're aware of it. Where could it go? It's in the cage. It can't go anywhere. Your problem is that you don't want anything going on in your mind. Lung Pu Man called that vacant state tree stump samadhi. If your mind is darting around, know that it's doing that. If it's motionless, then know that. What more do you need? Just have the measure of both movement and stillness. If today the mind is peaceful, then see it as a foundation for wisdom. But people like the peace. It makes them happy. They say, Today I had a wonderful sitting, so peaceful. There. If you think like that, then the next day it will be hopeless. Your mind will be a jumble. And then it's, oh, today my sitting was terrible. Ultimately, good and bad have the same value. Good things are impermanent. Bad things are impermanent. Why give them so much significance? If the mind is agitated, then look at that. If it's peaceful, then look at that. In this way, you allow wisdom to arise. Agitation is a natural expression of the mind. Just don't get caught up with it. A monkey doesn't keep still, does it? Suppose you see a monkey and start to feel uncomfortable because it won't keep still. You begin to wonder, when will it ever stop moving around? You want to make it still, so that you can feel at ease. But that's the way monkeys are. A Bangkok monkey, an Ubon monkey, monkeys are the same everywhere. It's a monkey's nature to move about, and realizing that is the end of the problem. If you're going to keep suffering all the time, because the monkey doesn't keep still, you're on your way to an early grave. You'll be even more of a monkey than a monkey is. Doubt and indecision The last of the hindrances, sceptical doubt, is the most insidious and crippling member of the group. It is characterized by vacillation, by the hesitation to follow through on a commitment. The hindrance occurs when meditators possess sufficient information about the teachings or the technique to take them through the initial stages of practice, but they become paralyzed by a need to be sure of the effectiveness of the method or the teacher or the teachings or their own capacity to progress before making the effort and renunciation necessary to verify it. Not all doubt is a hindrance to meditation practice. On the contrary, some doubts are taken to be signs of intelligence. Speaking to the Kalamas, the Buddha said, It is good. You are doubting about things worthy of doubt. 
the doubts of those who recognize that they lack the necessary information or the clear criteria to make a good choice are not considered to be defilements of the mind. The hindrance is born from a craving for guarantees that cannot be provided. The Buddha's simile to illustrate this hindrance is of a traveler lost in a desolate place, whose fear of the possible dangers on the path to safety outweigh his desire to reach that safety. In the early days of Wat Ba Pong, the majority of the monastics and lay supporters received only the rudiments of a formal education and had strong confidence in Luang Po. They were not given to much pondering over the teachings. Their main doubts would center on whether or not they wanted to remain as monks. In later years, with more people from the city coming to the monastery and growing numbers of Western disciples, overthinking became more of an issue in the monastery. Doubts about the teacher, the teaching, the student's ability to practice the teacher's teaching multiplied. Lung Po's response to the chronic doubters was always to point out, doubting never stops because of someone else's words. Doubts come to an end through your own actions. Placing unquestioning trust in the words of an authority figure can suppress doubts on one level but it's a strategy that can never achieve a lasting security from them. Luang Po taught that the only way to go beyond doubts was through insight into their nature as impermanent, conditioned mental states. On one occasion, he explained why he didn't conduct daily interviews with the monks, as is the practice in many meditation centers. If I answer your every little question, you will never understand the process of doubt in your own mind. It is essential that you learn to examine yourself, to interview yourself. Listen carefully to the Dhamma talk every few days. Then, use the teaching to compare with your own practice. Is it the same? Is it different? Why do you have doubts? Who is it that doubts? Only through self-examination will you understand. If you doubt everything, then you'll become totally miserable. You'll be off your food and unable to sleep, spending your whole time chasing after this view and that. What you must bear in mind is that your mind is a liar. Mental states are just that way. They don't last. Don't run around with them. Just know them with equanimity. As one doubt passes away and a new one arises in its place, be aware of that for what it is as well. Then you'll be at ease. If you rush about after your doubts, then not only will you be unhappy, but the doubts will increase. On reaching a certain point in their practice, some meditators would begin to wonder about the identity of the states they were experiencing while they were meditating. Luang Po would say they weren't on a highway, there were no signposts in the mind. On another occasion, he said that it did not really matter if you were ignorant of the name of a fruit, as long as you were aware of its sweetness and fragrance. Meditation is the same. It's not necessary to know what things are called. If you know the name of the fruit, that doesn't make it any sweeter. So be aware of the relevant causal conditions of that state. But if you don't know the name, it doesn't matter. You know the flavor. If someone tells you the name, then take note. But if they don't, there's no need to get upset. Luang Po once reassured a Western disciple, Doubting is natural. Everyone starts out with doubts. You can learn a great deal from them. What is important is that you don't identify with your doubts. That is, don't get caught up in them. This will spin your mind in endless circles. Instead, watch the whole process of doubting, of wondering. See who it is that doubts. See how doubts come and go. Then, you will no longer be victimized by your doubts. You will step outside of them, and your mind will be quiet. You can see how all things come and go. Just let go of what you are attached to. 
let go of your doubts and simply watch. This is how to end doubting.